Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Bachman, SVP with Defined Health and Head of Oncology, which is our largest practice area. We welcome you to today's Defined Health Insight Series webinar, Here We Go Again, Payer Management of Me Too's in the Modern Era of Oncology. Today's webinar will feature Aruni Don, Senior Consultant, and Ed Saltzman, Executive Chairman at Defined Health, as well as two panelists, Dr. Eric Rowinski, Chief Scientific Officer on Oncology at ClearPath Development Company, and Dr. Bruce Feinberg, Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at Cardinal Health Specialty Solutions. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that the Defined Health Oncology team will be presenting the renowned Cancer Progress meeting on May 8th and 9th in New York City. Cancer Progress was perhaps the first oncology-focused conference back in 1985 and remains today the foremost that triangulates the academic, clinical, and commercial aspects of oncology, providing an enriching dialogue around the opportunities and challenges that scientists, oncologists, and drug developers face daily as they progress management of cancer towards greater benefit for more patients. No data dumps or company commercials, uh, but open and frank discussion amongst the panelists with the audience. Our 29th annual meeting on May 8th and 9th will provide an unsurpassed experience for participants in quality of information, coverage of issues, and value of professional contacts amongst the stellar panelists and attendees. To register and to learn more, please visit cancerprogressbydh.com. To learn more about Defined Health and our early strategic commercial development services, whether in oncology or our other therapeutic areas, give us a call, send an email, or visit the website defineHealth.com. We hope to have time to field questions in the closing minutes of this session, so please send your questions in as you think of them, and if we don't get to them in today's allotted time, we will follow up with you directly in the next day or so. We anticipate the slides and an audio-visual edition of the webinar will be posted on the Defined Health website within the next several days. So thank you, and please enjoy this edition of Defined Health's Insight Series Briefings. I will now turn it over to Aruni. Thank you, Jeff. My name is Aruni Dawn, and I will be co-moderating this webinar titled, Here We Go Again, Payer Management of Me Too's in the Modern Oncology Era, along with Ed Saltzman, the Executive Chairman of Defined Health. The advent of many innovative personalized medicine and immuno-oncology therapies have revolutionized patient care with improved outcomes and declining mortality rates for many tumor types. Thus, no one questions the tremendous advances made in recent years for treatment of cancer. However, we all know that these transformative drugs in the modern oncology era come with high price tags. If you look at the data from this Quintal's IMS report, the global cost of cancer care in 2016 was in excess of $100 billion, and U.S. accounts for 46% of the total expenditure. In this webinar, we will focus on the U.S. market, and I'd like to point out that we have seen an 88% increase in the cost of oncology drugs in the U.S. over the five-year period from 2011 to 2016. This is partly due to increased uptake of new therapies, as well as disproportionate launches in the U.S. relative to the rest of the world. The question is, who is going to pay for these treatments when the average cost of some of these newer cancer drugs are more than $10,000 per month and combinations of checkpoint inhibitors costing upwards of $250,000 per year, for instance, Yervoy and Optivo in advanced melanoma? The financial burden is extremely high when co-pays, out-of-pocket expenses, and rising insurance premiums are too much for cancer patients and their families to bear. Even with coupons and patient savings programs that provide some relief, they're usually not adequate to address the financial burden that most patients and their families endure due to their cancer diagnosis. The problem is that these treatments are not curative and some only improve disease-free survival, but not overall survival. Furthermore, we have seen a rapid increase in the number of high-priced oncology drugs approved in the U.S., and more are on the way. Thus, it is obvious that the current system is unsustainable without adequate cost control measures of oncology drugs. As you can see on this slide, there's a growing number of oncology drugs in development for the same mechanistic class or drug target, and number of these in-class agents are being developed for the same target indication and or treatment setting. 
For today's webinar, we'll focus on how the rising cost of cancer care and the evolving payer market access landscape will impact management of oncology drugs over the next three to five years, especially in crowded categories. We'll ask our panelists what strategies will manufacturers developing products in these categories need to consider to differentiate their products from others pursuing similar labeling. As I noted earlier, the combinations of checkpoint inhibitors may cost as much as $250,000 per year, but what's the added value? Given the increasing number of combination trials that are currently ongoing, how and when will payers start to exert downward pressure and utilize established cost management tools that have been applied in other therapeutic categories? We'll ask our panelists whether such positioning strategies used by manufacturers to create differentiation and competitive advantage for what appears to be Me Too drugs could be viewed favorably by payers, and for how long? Will these products be forced to compete on price and other value-based payment models? The idea that oncology is a special case has been thrown around. Therefore, during our Q&A session, I'd like to raise that question and ask our panelists if oncology is permanently exempt from cost control measures applied to other categories. If so, what makes oncology unique? Is it simply because cancer is, in most cases, viewed as life and death situation versus other diseases? Or are there other reasons that have made it more challenging for payers to implement cost control measures in oncology? Up until now, oncology drugs for the most part have escaped stringent payer management. However, I believe we are at a turning point and may now be entering a new era with more aggressive management of oncology drugs intended to drive down the ever-increasing spending on cancer care in the U.S. Over the last several years, there has been a shift in the conversation among various stakeholders in healthcare from drug pricing to value. While there's still work that needs to be done to define and come to a consensus on what value means to each stakeholder, we are moving in the right direction with various value assessment frameworks in place to compare health and economic impact of new, especially high-cost treatments. It is evident that the rise in drug prices and healthcare costs must be addressed in multiple ways, including policy recommendations and such, to accelerate the shift towards value-based care for oncology. I'd like to wrap up my snapshot overview by asking a very important question that we'll soon delve into in our Q&A session with our esteemed panelists, and that is, what's the future outlook for oncology market access and reimbursement, and what should manufacturers be thinking about to differentiate their products from other in-class agents pursuing similar labeling in crowded categories? But before we start the conversation with our guest panelists, I would like to uh, note that Ed and I will be moderating this, co-moderating this panel um, shortly. All right, so let's get started with our Q&A session. Um, first of all, I... I'd like to ask um, Dr. Ruinsky to briefly introduce yourself um, and to provide some context by highlighting the innovation and tremendous progress made in recent years for treatment of cancer, focusing specifically on drug classes discussed in this webinar. Okay, well, thank you, Aruni. Um, and and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Eric Rowinski, and I'm a, I'm a medical oncologist and uh, I have been uh, involved and really thankfully so, um, very fortunately to be involved with um, really new drug development in cancer all of my professional career. And um, I think that I've seen almost everything in the last 25 years, thankfully so. And um, to, to, really, to really qualify um, it, some of the discussion today, my, my first experience in drug development and, and something that wet my whistle was really the development of Paxil, which um, I played a role in about twin in the late eighties and the middle eighties. And and that was a value that was a that was a medication that was considered a value, an incremental medication 
that that really changed um, uh, the lives of, of and, and the natural history of, of many of many diseases, but yet it was associated with, like many of the drugs of that era that followed, um, irinotecan and topotecan, and these were our new oncology drugs, drugs that um, were nonspecific and associated with um, efficacy, definitely, but also toxicity. And I think over the years, um, as we as we basically uh, exhausted many cytotoxic targets and learned a lot more about cancer biology. And I think that's, that's been key. You know, we've, it, the science, the science actually came first and then the therapeutics came after. And as we, and as we went from cytotoxics, we, we basically focused on um, targeted therapies, targeting aberrations that we really had um, that drove cancer, and this was largely based on knowledge and and the value of those therapeutics, I think one could say in their narrow um, indications, such as um, EGFR mutations for EGFR TKIs and trastuzumab herceptin for those with amplified HER2, were even more valuable because they really seemed to confer substantial efficacy and, and not only efficacy but clinical benefit um, and that's a the eyes of what of what clinical benefit benefit is is in the beholder generally but for these medications um, conferring survival advantages and major um, increments in progression free survival and um, in, in relief of symptoms I think were unquestionable and we we're now entering a different era and uh, an era of, of, of biologics, um, new compounds that, um, that, that really impact uh, or bring the immune system into play, something that we've discounted for a long period of time. But I, I think we're making advances largely due to the science, and there's, there's great excitement. There's, there, there's the pharmaceutical industry over the last 10 to 15 years is, is really engaged in this process. And um, I think we're seeing some, you know, extraordinary ramifications for patients. And, you know, I, I trained in an era, and I'll, I'll stop my comments in a few minutes uh, or a few seconds, but in an era where patients were dying of CML and, and multiple myeloma overall survival was, was eight to 10 months. And I, I think there, unquestionably, we've, we've made incredible changes and, and incredible progress. But I think we're running into major challenges. We can't advance the pace of, of drug development and clinical trials largely because of the competition for patients, the availability of therapeutics on the market, and, um, and, and basically the, the availability of therapeutics that are Me Too therapeutics, I think, um, and, and Rooney, your slide really depicted many of those, um, that are competing with each other. Uh, for patients, and and I think largely stymieing clinical drug development and increasing the expense of clinical development, which which is partly responsible for overall expense, but not fully as responsible. And I think we'll we'll talk about some of the other factors that that are associated with the expense and costs of drugs. But we we've, we've slowed down, and I'm I'm very worried that the number of Me Too therapies. Are, are not only problematic um, overall in, in the macro environment, but also in the clinical environment, in the clinical development environment, and will slow down our progress. Um, so I'll stop here. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so Bruce, um, would you like to briefly introduce yourself and at a very level, High level, you know, talk about what major payer trends you have observed in recent years and what you see, uh, foresee in the near future and reflect back on what, you know, Eric was just saying. Sure. Thanks, Aruni. Uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruce Feinberg. Um, I, I finished my medical oncology training at MD Anderson in 1987, uh, just after uh, the ASCO meetings where I had the uh, pleasure and opportunity to present uh, the first phase one trial of tumor necrosis factor in cancer patients. 28 patients, no responses. 
but of course TNF inhibitors became the backbone of rheumatologic therapy. Um, working in developmental therapeutics uh, in my fellowship and get exposure to the first wave of immuno-oncology with interferons, interleukins, uh, TNF, um, ends up uh, being fascinating. And I was thinking about Eric's comments, and for those who may have read uh, the Emperor of All Maladies uh, or saw the PBS um, version, doc documentary version of it, um, it's just remarkable to think that Eric and I got to live through um, one of the most remarkable periods um, of any science development. But the world of, in the, uh, of medical oncology to treat systemic treatment of cancer essentially developed in our lifetimes. And we were witnesses of that. Um, along the way, our journeys were different and we had different exposures. Um, mine being in private practice for 23 years um, allowed me to witness much of that uh, from a different perspective than uh, being in the drug development arena. Um, and that was the way that these uh, therapies were being adopted and used. Uh, fortunately, um, I started a solo practice in Atlanta in, in 1987. Atlanta was a good place to be in the 90s. Uh, 23 years later, 46 doctors, 36 mid-levels, 27 locations. Um, I, I started to see a perspective change. Um, and, I, and from just looking at the impact of what we were doing on the individual patients I was treating and the impact of policy and programming that was being done across the 46 doctors and the 10,000 plus new patients we were seeing a year. And it really had me rethink my, what my future should be. And I left the practice to become the chief medical officer at Cardinal Health, where I have focused on various models like clinical pathway programs for oncology and rheumatology, um, comparative effectiveness and outcomes research in oncology, rheumatology, and other areas. And um, it, it starts to bring to light uh, um, so many of the issues and the potential solutions that we have for those issues today. Um, during my practice career, I was fortunate of serving on the National Advisory Boards for both WellPoint and United Healthcare in, in the realm of cancer. And I will tell you that um, as I've gotten to work in the different uh, stakeholder industries, um, everyone's putting their best foot forward. It often sounds like it's um, not uh, collaborative or collegial. Um, and, and that's not necessarily the case. These are tough problems to solve. Uh, the processes that I saw being used to determine medical necessity uh, by the payers, um, to determining when something goes from experimental um, to being real world, um, are elaborate and well-constructed. Um, eventually, for most payers, they adopted NCCN guidelines. They varied on what that inclusion criteria for the vast majority uh, NCCN level 1, 2A, and 2B became the criteria. But for NCCN, certainly for most of its, uh, of its life, um, those can be quite broad because our system um, allows um, a decentralized uh, research process. And so MD Anderson has its approach, from Oral Sloan Kettering its approach, UCLA its approach, and the result is you'll have three regimens being developed that are related but not identical not compared head to head, and so we start to amass a guideline in no positive HER2 negative breast um, that could be 15 to 20 different regimens, all with the same level of evidence, but not compared head to head. And so, how do you start to look at them comparatively? NCCN has finally embraced that. Now they have preferred regimens. At what point does preferred regimens move to a much more refined process, which is often the process used for clinical pathway development? that starts to look more like nice. And these are the tough issues that we're gonna to have to struggle with as a society and as an industry. And we're gonna be getting more to that with specific questions uh, as Aruna continues uh, to moderate the session. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Um, so given what you said, you know, with that decentralized approach, what do you foresee, at least in the near future for oncology in terms of market access and reimbursement? for these, um, especially the crowded categories? Yeah, I think that, you know, the political correctness of restricting using step edits, tier, uh, tiering, or some other mechanism that's most commonly done in orals and by PBMs rather than by the payers themselves. Um, it, it's unclear to me if the industry is really ready to embrace those methods in oncology. 
Now, you can look at oncology and the therapeutics and put them into classes. You can say there's supportive care, um, there is treatment um, of, of chronic disease, more to hematologic than oncologic diagnoses, and, and then and there's treatment of, uh, of, of life, at, at life at risk disease. And in those life and death decision making, we can even further define disease which is curative and disease which is palliative. And, and, I, and you can start to see where there might be more willingness, and there's certainly we can say there's been some willingness with Zarxio um, to start to say supportive care um, there, you know, should be um, fully exposed to all the tools that payers and PBMs uh, have available to them. Um, the next question will be, when will that, the next area that is likely uh, to, to be addressed would be palliative. Uh, but we haven't seen it yet, and we haven't seen it from um, the payer side, but we also aren't seeing it from the manufacturer side. There's lots of complexity around that, uh, the complexity around the nature of rebates, discounts, and the ways in which the contracting is done, but also the nature of drug development. And oncology, very different. So we often heard with hepatitis C that that was kind of a bellwether, and we saw the industry cave. It's really one of the few examples um, where we were seeing um, a lot of me too's and the willingness of a manufacturer to significantly reduce costs and really bring the overall cost structure down for the class. But they were very different products, and they were products that had a specific indication, a single indication. We're looking at IO right now. If you look at the immuno-oncology drugs, we have some that will be tested in as many as 52 unique malignancies or unique malignant states. And when you start to look at that um, and the nature of our defined system, you can't, once you cave on a price for a specific indication, you're going to cave on that price across all indications. And uh, that, that's a hard, that's a hard step to take uh, if you're in drug development. And so I don't see manufacturers necessarily caving to the pressures of payers and PBMs within oncology. And I see the hesitancy certainly in curative intent therapy to start to put those tough restrictions. Now, there are some interesting models. So Anthem took the approach of a clinical pathway in which rather than changing the medical uh, benefit design uh, or the definition of what's medically necessary and non-experimental, what they said is we have a preferred formula, and that is part of our pathway. And if you operate within the pathway, that pathway management will give you a, a bonus payment. And so rather than saying, no, you can't administer or here are the barriers to administration of a particular agent, if you use the preferred agent, and now we have oncologists doing, you know, a lot of sophisticated financial analysis to see if those bonus payments uh, versus giving the non-pathway option, which is still within medical policy, uh, is the better option for the practice. So the complexity persists. We're starting to see some experimentation in, as we look at supportive care in oncology and as we look at the pathway use by Anthem. I think there's still going to be some of that experimentation, but I don't see wholesale changes, and certainly not in, in curative intent disease management. Okay. Yeah. Least not this is Eric. I, I also just want to, and I'd love to hear Bruce's comment, and I'm sure we'll talk about this. Like, where where did these things, these very high costs emanate from? And you know, it's it's often very difficult to to, to understand. Like, where where did it all come from? Where did the you know, eighty thousand uh, dollars a year. Oh, I shouldn't even say that. Fifteen thousand dollars a month for medications, and and often, you know, you look back and how do we how do we price drugs in the industry? And it's often it's often based on precedence. What's the what has the other guy done before? And and you know, what's a, what what's a mere comparator? What's a comparator group? And and you and and you basically try to go back and. It, it's interesting that the high costs of several of these drugs emanated from refractory situations where patients really weren't garnering much in the way of um, of, of benefit uh, in, in any way you look at it. And you know, we we kept building um, on sort of a um, you know a, a mountain that that really has no teeth. And and therefore, you know, it's 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 very hard to differentiate those drugs that um, are are valuable, are truly valuable, first line drugs, drugs that actually can portend very in, very significant increases in survival from the prices of drugs that are 
um, basically have been developed in refractory situations and have negligible effects across the board. Agree. And I think let's let's um, turn to the bladder cancer situation because that's where some of these agents have been moved to first line setting. Um, so as you saw in the pipeline, you know there's these crowded care categories, um, and I'd like to focus uh, in on the metastatic bladder cancer case. Um, as of now, there are five different checkpoint inhibitors, all approved for treatment of second line relapse setting after platinum chemo with treatment currently dominated by platinum, chemo, cisplatin, carboplatin, and the checkpoint inhibitors. And two of them, Tocentric and Keytruda, are also approved for use in first line in cisplatin ineligible patients. So these single agents, um, the PD-1, PD-L1 drugs, all have response rates between 15 to 20 percent that are durable, lasting up to two to three years after the initiation of um, treatment. So. Eric, from the oncologist's perspective, how do you think the physicians will choose between these agents if the labeling is very similar, meaning that there's uh, very little differences in how these agents work mechanistically and similar range of efficacy and all targeting the same patient population and treatment setting? And as you mentioned, you know, is the value um, as great in the first line setting as it is in that second refractory setting that it was initially approved for? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And, you know, bladder isn't the only example. One can, could also look at second line lung where um, several of these agents, at, le at least two or three in each category of PD-1s and PD-L1s are approved. And, you know, I I think one, I think, I still believe in oncologists, and I believe that oncologists will look at the data. And, you know, with regard to the data, as you've mentioned before, efficacy would, would rise to the top. I think we still look at efficacy, and, you know, the efficacy parameters may, in essence, not be as, one may not be as valuable as another. Truly clinical benefit is, you know, I, I think associated with relief of symptoms and um, and often correlated with response rate, and of course, clinical benefit is 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 uh, survival is certainly reflective of, of that term, clinical benefit. But as you just gave an example of, I I think if it it it, it does appear in these refractory settings in second and third line that the efficacy parameters are the same. So the oncologist is often you know going down the list, uh, safety. And I think you find in, in the category of IO inhibitors and PARP inhibitors, and, and I know we can debate nuances on this from today to tomorrow, but essentially safety is very similar. So what does the oncologist do? They're looking at other factors that may not be as notable um, for that particular patient. It may be um, a biomarker. Did the manufacturer really do their studies in um, in a biomarker restricted patient population or not? Um, they, did they choose the right biomarker? Um, and then there are other, and I think with regard to the IO inhibitors, these other, these other um, um, determinants of, of, of choice come into play, and they're, they're very soft. Um, is that drug given every two weeks or every three weeks? Uh, is the drug given every four weeks? And you, you've, you've seen Optivo, um, you know, I, I think Bristol Myers basically had a, a was, was basically um, a second choice because of the every two weeks rather than the every three week schedule. So what did they do? Substantial clinical trials uh, involving uh, a, a, a labeling modification to every four weeks. So that's the major improvement in the label. And what did it translate into patients cost-wise? Probably very little. So it's things like this, stability of the drug, fixed dosing versus dosing per meter squared. So we're seeing, we're seeing, you know, with regard to the PARP inhibitors, also the labels actually converging on, on a very sim similar indications, the IO inhibitors, particularly PD-1 and second line metastatic bladder and, and metastatic lung converging on very similar indications. And we're seeing basically the competition and choice being made on soft pharmaceutical dosing administration aspects, but more so, and I'm, I probably would, would um, I think Bruce is more qualified to talk about this, but um, contract 
pricing, um, how and and basically cost to that physician or to the third party. Uh, um, and so th these choices are being made on the basis of, of pharmaceutical aspects, administration aspects, but also on, I think on the basis of cost to the practice. Um, exactly. So if you know if the physician choice is not, then the efficacy and safety is essentially the same. Why do what from Bruce? What's your perspective? Do payers care that? There are minor differences in dosing and um, administrations or, you know, those soft determinants. How does that matter to payers? And is, is that going to lead to, um, you know, exclusion of certain products if there's five, essentially, with the same efficacy range and safety profiles? So I, <clears throat> my experience with payers is that um, they, they take a, a pretty practical bottom line approach. And if the efficacy and the toxicity and even the quality of life, which gets into route and frequency of administration, um, if they're all essentially the same and there's no cost differentiate, dif differential, so these are basically, for the most part, non-differentiated drugs, they have to decide if they want, what battles they want to wage. And, and often, that's not a battle they want to wage. If, if there is a manufacturer with a diminished market share, that is willing to negotiate in order to get that preferential placement. Uh, I think they would do that. Um, but, I, but again, given the nature of the of IO and uh, the number of indications that all the manufacturers are seeking, um, it would be not just a race to the bottom, but they would be potentially shooting themselves in the foot for an indication in which they may have differential benefit. And and, and that so that and that is still when the differential benefit is in a combination uh, setting because those combinations often have unique pairings, um, or whether it is in a particular disease set, or disease setting. Um, you know, and we've had some of those the first line lung setting, uh, in in the bladder first line setting where we've seen some differences, although the differences are likely trial design more than they're specific to the class of drug. So, I, I, I again, I think from a payer perspective. You choose your battles wisely, and you have to decide, especially when you look at bladder. So it's not a top five malignancy state. It's not lung, breast, prostate, colon, uh, lymphoma. Where, where, where do you want to choose those battles? And I, um, I, my guess is you know, that will be left alone um, until there is a willingness um, from a manufacturer um, to really play hardball with contracts. Hey, Bruce, this is Ed Saltzman. I'm going to follow up on that question just a little bit. So um, I want to be clear as to whether you are actually believe whether battles will actually be waged or not, um, whether that's a fight that payers um, and plans want to pick, um, because you're saying, I, I think you're saying clear two things, be clear as to where you might stand. Um, so from the, from the first thing, you're saying maybe they don't want to pick those battles. On the second one, you're sort of alluding to or inferring that they might pick those battles in areas like lung, perhaps breast, where you've got a, a, a patient population that's substantially larger and therefore, you know, greater budget impact. Um, can you can you comment on that? Yeah. So again, I, I only see it happening if you've got a willing partner on the biopharma side in terms of you know of making that battle you know significantly worthwhile to the bottom line. Um, so what, what I because I think from a payer perspective, what they really want to get hold of is the waste in the system. You know, we look at programs like Choosing Wisely, which have been introduced, and we look at the adoption rates; they're very low. Growth factor, uh, white, uh, white cell growth factor use in patients being treated in a palliative care setting. Um, I just recently did a study looking at uh, radiation therapy to bone, single fraction treatment versus high multi-fraction treatment. Um, these, these are not, these waste areas, um, third, fourth, and fifth line treatments where there's no evidence basis for it, and, and the absence of going, of moving into palliative care, where Temo back in 2010 showed that a palliative care approach in that setting not only dramatically reduces cost, but may actually increase length of life because you're not taking frail patients and giving them toxic therapy. So, I, my, everything I've, I've heard, seen, discussed with payers 
is those are the those are the battles they'd rather wage and focus on. Is it appropriate to give that fourth line therapy where there's no data? And if you want to do that, then you know get him into the taper study and give him free drug. Um, then and it is about wanting to start to pick winners when it comes to drugs, unless again somebody really steps up and makes a compelling argument to that one. So, Bruce, don't you, this is Eric again, don't you feel that now with so many competitors out there, all with very similar drugs, with very similar um, uh, efficacy and safety parameters, and don't you think that some a pharmaceutical manufacturer is more likely to, to step up and do deals with um, third parties and potentially... Um, you know, cause this disruption that we really haven't seen, and I'm I'm just playing the devil's advocate. Yeah, no, I you know I I think you know I, again we have great examples. Um, you know, we've got five you know to some degree you know not well differentiated TKIs in renal cell and a similar number in CML. Um, I think the problem and the difference is in many other disease areas, drugs are developed for specific disease. If we think of cancer as literally hundreds of diseases where these drugs might have multiple indications. And if you are to reduce price in any one, um, you're going to re reduce price with, with all. And as this area is so ripe for development, whether in combinations in still the number of malignancy states that are still in phase two and, and early phase three research, um, it doesn't take a lot at the current pricing to get a billion dollar drug. And so you can literally have an ultra orphan indication and win in that one indication. And you can have at the current pricing level a billion dollar product. So I, I it, it just the way the current industry is structured, um, it's hard to see where that math works out. And and the result of that is, you know, you're gonna hang on for a long time and there clearly will be losers, you know, um, as we saw with TKIs. But again, you know, you're talking about five plus years now you know, with this wealth of TKIs in renal cell and in CML, um, to the extent that they now have a generic in the market, and yet it didn't happen. No one cared. So I, 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 the history would say it's not, you know, it's improbable, and the market structure would say it's improbable. Thank do you, you see that? Do you see that market structure, you know, changing in the five years? From now, I mean, what what? Well, I, I I do, and but again, I, I think it's going to be around not so much on the drug and the need to, but you know, it's going to be more around that periphery, um, and and the impetus for that would be likely something more along the lines of OCM, and so the oncology care model is the advanced payment model um, that was introduced by CMS as part of uh, the innovation project. Um, they didn't do it, they didn't, they didn't initiate as a pilot, but rather 196 practices and 16 payers. That rep the, the total patient population being managed represents about 50% of the Medicare uh, population with cancer. And the performance metrics piece, so in the first two years, there were bonus payments being made, and it was a reporting requirement in year three and four and five costs of the care that's being provided becomes an increasing part of the equation that determines the extent to which you're shared risk. And with performance metrics just being released to practices in February, it will be fascinating to see how that starts to impact their choice of therapy. And I don't think it will necessarily impact the, the specific drug within the mechanistic class, but it will start to impact these questions about use of, use of supportive care, introduction of palliative care. So I think it will have peripheral benefit, um, I, but I don't think, at least in this first iteration, in the next two years, we're going to start to see it um, impacting choice of therapy, you know, mechanistically. I think it's going to be the other drivers, and that gets into complex behavioral economics. You know, Octavo continues to have the lead because it was first, and, and doctors have that experience with it and a comfort level with it which always gives the, you know, the first in an advantage, but particularly unique in I.O. And I'm speaking at, 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 you know, quite frequently, and I'm speaking often to uh, providers and 
you know, my 25, 30 years now in the industry and knowing providers, I'm often being curbsided, you know, before and after presentations. And typically along the lines, the conversation goes, well, you really read the tea leaves and got out at a great time. And then, but you really missed something special about treating patients in the I.O. era. That you walk into your office and the waiting room is packed and all, everybody has their hair and they look healthy and they feel good and it totally changes kind of what it was like to practice oncology. So there's this, you know, to coin the term, or not to use the coin term, um, there's an irrational exuberance around that class of drug um, and, and possibly putting it in a position that isn't necessarily consistent with all the evidence, but nonetheless, it's there. And, and so how then the third and the fourth and the fifth um, are going to be picked up and used and how the behavioral economics of that experience are going to frame that use um, is going to be very interesting to watch. You know, being the third and fourth and fifth and sixth allow companies, I mean, there are some intangibles. They allow companies to to develop their products, to utilize the I.O. And, and with other products um, or to utilize the PD-1, which would be unobtainable um, in the marketplace because of cost. And I, I do think that that is that is a reason for some, at least, of the development of Me Too's at some pharmaceutical companies. And I guess this is kind of off topic today, but I think we have to consider that. Well, I, I, I do agree. I do agree that the, the latecomers, um, I, I anticipate what we'll see is a lot more of the latecomers introduced as a combination. Um, and, and that, and, and in a way, to kind of move them back to the front of the line. Okay. Um, so, but do you see, um, and this can be a um, question to Bruce or Eric, that the, you know, the market forces and, you know, competitive pressures, at least when we look at the other therapeutic categories, the payers, um, you know, put cost control measures um, that have worked uh, effectively in other areas. Uh, why, why does not, why doesn't that work in oncology? For example, the anti-TNF market, when you look at that, there are several in-class drugs approved for use um, in essentially identical treatment settings across rheumatology indications, and payers have excluded certain drugs um, and give, given preferred status for others. Can, can that be applied into the oncology setting, or what's stopping payers from doing that? Yeah, and I want to just, this is Ed, and I just want to add one follow-up, and perhaps it's a devil's of the devil's advocate, you know, um, from before, um, and react to something that, that Bruce said, you know, um, this concept of the race to the bottom, um, and, you know, most companies that I, on the pharma side, or on the biotech side, have no desire to participate in the race to the bottom. The race to the bottom is entirely provoked by the pressures of the marketplace in crowded categories. So, um, and there were battles, and I think you know this well, um, and many of you out there know this quite well as well, um, within the larger pharmaceutical market or the rest of the pharmaceutical market where those battles didn't want to be fought by the payer side. A great example is insulin. Um, so as you looked at insulin and you looked at the fact that it was an injectable therapy, there were multiple different forms of insulin. They had different regimens. They were so, some degree differentiated, but what you also saw was an enormous um, increase in the price and the cost of insulin therapy. Um, that combined with the crowded conditions in the market um, forced rebating and contracting that actually a number of, of pharma CEOs who no longer have their jobs actually read the tea leaves quite wrong on that and did not think um, that they needed to participate in a race to the bottom. Um, similar similar um, experience was had, and it, they may be um, less of an issue, but they are still a device-oriented category in the lava-lama combinations, you know, in respiratory disease. So we have seen these in big, expensive categories. Um, so I just want to just add a little bit of, 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 of addition to Rooney's question to say we do know that because of all the things we've discussed about oncology, um, that it has resisted these market forces, which, which appear to have been solidly entrenched now in the other therapeutic areas. So just want to add that as perhaps a, a little bit of, of context to Rooney's question as well and, and get comments from both of you. So I, I would argue that it's the complexity. 
I would argue it's the complexity of ontology that, that differentiates okay. it. So, so let's look at an example that's very well known probably to all the listeners. Um, so aromatase inhibitors have been in the marketplace, I guess, close to 20 years. Now, there were three introduced almost simultaneously, and they had three different trial designs. So one was being used after tamoxifen for those patients who became menopausal while in tamoxifen or had already started tamoxifen. One was being used um, in patients who were already menopausal, and, and so they didn't have uh, any tamoxifen exposure. You had this different design. And as a result, they each got that indication. Now, you started to see the clinicians after a period of time, and I can tell you that in my own practice, we had three specific populations, and each got a different aromatase inhibitor because that was the evidence supported. Now, eventually, there was that comfort, and there was beginning to be KOL commentaries um, that would allow you to start to select to say that they're all equivalent and you could use them. Um, irrespective of the, uh, of the setting, the clinical setting. But there is still published data. There, there, are tri tri there was a trial just reported this week, still affirming, or, or trying to affirm today, that there's adequate evidence that they're interchangeable. Uh, 20 years, and we're looking at something, you know, like, um, you know, a fairly, you know, low complexity um, drug design and management area, you know, of, uh, in, in terms of hormonal therapy of breast cancer. So I, I, I think it's that design. And so now you've got a, a, a PD-1 that, you know, with its fire marker, um, has proof of benefit in the first-line setting, and another one doesn't. And you have one that has it in the adjuvant, and you've got one that has it in stage, in, in stage 3B in lung, um, or stage 3 and 3B in lung, but doesn't, you know, and so you have a, a use there. And so you can't more or less take these drugs out of your formulary if you're in a practice and you can't necessarily remove them if you're a payer in order to consolidate to a single and say, first treatment for any patient with lung, if it's a PD-1, if it's IO, is S. You can do that in RA. Now, that's going to change in RA because as the research increases, we're starting to define RA subpopulations like early rapidly progressive patients who don't necessarily do nearly as well with TNF inhibitors they do with other classes. And so the unfortunate thing is that science which Eric alluded to in his opening comment, may drive the complexity in the reverse. Instead of simplifying it for oncology and making it more like other disease areas, it may add complexity to the disease areas and make them look more like oncology. You know, I, I also um, think there's a lot of reasons. I mean, the, the answer to that question is so difficult to answer I mean, uh, uh, until now. And I also think that, you know, which insurance is going to be the bad guy to go after um, cancer patients who are utilizing experimental medications that are that are being used at the end of life for very short periods of time for the most part. But I think Ed, you know, it things are changing, and thank good thank goodness things are changing. And now we're we have sizable portions of patients who are going to be on 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 these very expensive drugs for long periods of time. And we've always been saying that the bank is going to break, and um, it, it, it numbers indicate that it must, it, it is going to break. So I, I definitely think the answer is going to be there. It has to be there. And you know, maybe that um, you know we're going to see a centralized form of of fighting back from third parties, uh, unless we don't take the bull by the horn yeah. ourselves. Um, yes, Eric, I, I think we had some. A difficulty hearing you. I'm not sure if it's um, on your side with the audio, um, but just let you know. Oh, okay. I'm I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I, go go ahead. ahead. No, you probably didn't hear the most intelligent things I said. But. <laughs> well, whatever you just did to make the adjustment, it's now more clear. Yeah. So, you know, you know I, I, I'm I'm basically, what I basically said, and I think I, I moved in an area of. Uh, uh, that in their in terms of communications is who who wh which party which third party is was going to be the bad boy um you know over the last couple of years when we were dealing with very expensive medications that are used um primarily and the end the end of life that that really didn't um that that really didn't imply chronicity of use but that is all changing thank goodness it's all changing but it's it's just I think I think the day is upon us, and 
we we just may see um, the bad boys do it in I should say the bad boys, but the insurance the the insurers do it in a very centralized means, either Medicare or third parties or both. And I think we're seeing that. I think we're starting to see remnants of that. We're certainly starting to see, um, uh, you know, Mr. Trump and others uh, um, get on their soapbox about it. And I think I think our industry needs to police itself, basically. So we only have um, a, a few more minutes, and um, and first of all, you know, as, as Rooney may have indicated earlier, um, and, and certainly it's clear that this is a very, very, very deep and complex subject, and given the amount of investment and the competitive structure in the oncology market right now, it's obviously one of an enormous importance, and we can't do it justice in an hour or 10 hours or weeks or, or months. Um, but, but I think one thing I would like to just get um, a couple of observations on while we have time is in Aruni's upfront introduction, um, she made an excellent point of, of demonstrating data to show that the system that we are currently having remains unsustainable. And, and again, it is the system that was characterized, and I think, Eric, you characterized it before, that essentially says the way oncology drug pricing is determined is what did the last company charge um, and in a few years ago, it was, what did the last company charge? We're going to charge 20% more. Um, that's actually moved back um, because of, of the oncology community, you know, um, pushback. But we are pretty much where you characterized, you know, where we are. Um, you know, the, the, the federal government, and particularly HHS, which interestingly enough is now being headed by Alex Zar, who was formerly, as you know, a senior executive with Lilly, um, has already started um, looking at oncology and saying we're, we're going to focus on oncology. Um, we have a big problem with a lot of these drugs sitting on Medicare Part B. If we could shift some of them over to Part D, it would let them get in the hands of people like PBMs who really know how to control cost. Um, one of the things, though, and I'm thinking back, um, Bruce, to something you said as well, you know, much, much earlier is, is, is simply the, the focus on, on outcomes on, on, the, on the oncology care, you know, model um, where physicians are more incentivized in outcomes of which cost is a very significant, you know, component of that, you know, of that outcome. Um, but as, as physicians, what, what that makes me sort of think in, you know, on, on the high 30,000 foot level, um, and I mentioned this in conversations with Aruni and our team here, is that Oncology remains perhaps, perhaps unique in that um, the physician has, still has a major and the oncology practice still has a financial incentive or a financial relationship with the administration of pharmaceuticals, which doesn't typically occur um, to any great degree outside the, um, you know, and there's certainly there are examples in immunology, and I don't wish to say oncology is the only one. But it, it is the one in which the use of fundamentally Part B drugs is so enormous. Um, so in, in sort of a way of, of, of wrapping up and saying, you know, how does, this, how does this change? What are the ways you kind of read the signals that are coming out from, from HHS in terms of some of the ways, you know, they are thinking about and, and thinking about, you know, changing the way uh, we think about these drugs and the cost of these drugs. Well, um, so I, you know, it's interesting that you know we we tend to follow a certain logic, um, and that logic is that um, if oncologists directly benefit um, from the administration of those high cost drugs, then they're more likely to administer them. But uh, that that allows for fairly easy research to be done. So you could look at community on oncologists and then. Uh, with real world evidence, you know, do a match cohort of staff model academic physicians um, and look at patients who are not on clinical trial with given malignancies and see if their patterns of care are different and if there's a lower cost. And I've actually done that and published some of that work, and it's not different. Um, so I, 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 even even though it's it is it seems so logical, um, there's so many different compelling um, narratives that are impacting choice of therapy. And it's still mostly driven by efficacy, toxicity, and then 
the notion of if you were the steward of a patient's life, um, trying to provide life. And that is, I, I think, still the underpinning of what most of those therapies, most of that high cost of care, that late line care, it's not because, I will tell you that additional analysis is that those late line care patients, which are most often treated with generics, uh, with not a high profit center um, from, from an oncology clinic, and they are very, very resource intensive. They're coming in, they have protracted visits, they're using all the personnel. No docs like going to a hospital, it's extremely inefficient use of their time. And these are the patients who do that. So I don't think it's really an economic model that's driving it. And, and again, my research suggests that it's not. But, but that aside, I think from an HHS perspective, the OCM model is where the brain trust came down to. We've got to put cost in seat equation. We've got to make the docs think more holistically because they control the pen, they control the purse, and we've got to see if this works. And I think that really we've got to let it play out and see what happens over the next two years and if that is a successful model. Um, because the other models have not been nearly as successful and certainly the ones that are more draconian, um, you know, carry all, all, all the weight and baggage uh, of taking those kinds of approaches. Thank you. And um, Eric, do you have any responses to that question? No, there's some that are very interesting. Um, in the next few minutes, um, I'd like to um, ask the one final question, and that is related to management of small molecules um, in oncology versus biologics. Um, when we look at PARP inhibitors or CDK4, 6 drug class, um, do you see any, def any differences in how those small molecules will be managed um, from the payer's perspective? No, I, I this is Eric, I, I really think the same construct that we've been talking about exists, sometimes even more so for a small molecule. The small mo I, I don't really see, um, I, I, I don't really see any differences here. There may be some more room to give um, on the on the on the part of the manufacturer because of the cost of small molecules, but biologics, let's face it, are are also you know, fairly inexpensive compared to the margin. Um, but but I think the rules apply um, to, to small molecules. The same rules apply, and I think you know with regard to the the PARP inhibitors, yeah, I it's it's quite it's quite easy to see that. You know, if you look at where the indications were, you put the three that were approved, you know, two years ago, and now you look at the indications, they're they're converging on the same indication. Um, but there may be some more subtle safety differences in in small molecules as compared to biologics that impact on um, that may that may actually lead to more differentiation. Okay. And Bruce, do you have any um, thoughts on that? Do you yeah, I, 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 I also don't significantly differentiate them. Um, the one thing I will comment uh, about is that, you know, certainly it, small molecules, you know, they go through more of a hatch waxman process and become generic. We also have to understand that um, the, the current model, the current pricing structure model, works works poorly at both ends. And so what you end up having is you then get, with the generic, the race to the bottom. And so you then have a drug um, that has multiple, multiple vendors um, who are manufacturing and making little margin on it. And so the margin erodes to the point that vendors start to drop out, and then you eventually get back to sole source. And then once you get back to sole source, you get price escalation, which doesn't work particularly well in the ASP modeling, or you get extremely short supply. And so we struggle with that as well. Short supply, cytoxin is a great example of a drug, you know, which got priced so low that no one wanted to manufacture it. Um, and so we, we, we have a system that doesn't work very well. Um, and, and I guess maybe that's the example. If you look across all of our healthcare, we, we need some pretty radical changes. Um, and, and these kind of fingers in the dike approaches, you know, we need to have the bigger conversation. And, and I, I like kind of the OCM as a bigger conversation item. Um, but I think we need more of that across every across all the industries. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, I know we're out of time, um, and if there's any other, as Ed mentioned, you know, we can continue go on with this conversation for hours. 
Um, but if, if there's any questions from the audience, we'll take it offline. Um, thank you. This has been a great conversation. Thank you to our team panelists, Drs. Eric Rowinski and Bruce Feinberg. Um, thank you to all my colleagues for their input, particularly Jeff Bachman and the oncology team and the payer market access team, including Leandra and Akash and the BD team. Finally, thank you to Ed for his constant support and guidance and co-moderating this webinar with me. Uh, we look forward to the next payer market access webinar, and I hope you all can join us at Cancer Progress on May 8th and 9th for continued discussion on this topic. Thank you all. Thank you.